Jesus, we just um, so badly need to be reminded of that today. That it is your name that reigns above every name. You are the king of all kings. And we need to be reminded of that in light of everything that we've experienced this week as a nation. With more division, more disruption, more violence. We're asking that you bring peace. We're asking that you heal where there needs to be healing. That you would unify where there needs to be unity. We pray, God, that as your followers, that we would set the course for that, that we would lead the way, that we would be people who live in a way that is loving to all people we would be a group of people who would unify where there's division. So God, we're just we're praying today that you continue to do a good work in our lives and in our church and in our communities and in our nation. And we're just going to keep our hands open. We're going to keep saying yes to you, Jesus, because you are the king of all kings. And your name reigns above all other names. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, listen, I just want to say again that uh, we are so, so glad uh, to have you here at LCBC today. And, um, and particularly because we started this series last week, I thought we just got kicked off to just a great start with this series that we've called Rethinking My Life. And if you're newer to LCBC, I'll just say that, you know, um, maybe the best way to think about when whenever we start a new series or a new teaching series, it's kind of like a Netflix show where, you know, we have one main topic that we explore throughout the whole series, but each week, it's almost like a brand new episode, and each week builds on the other weeks as we unpack the topic from different angles. And so today, we're continuing on the conversation that we started last week, and it's, and it's really a series, this whole series, Rethinking My Life, it's really a series about change how change happens in our lives, and specifically, maybe more importantly, how God brings about change in our lives. You know, the topic of change, it's actually you know, very relevant at this time of the year with a brand new year, it's January, start of the new year, because you know, this is a time of year that we tend to, to evaluate some of the patterns in our lives, and we begin to ask, to, you know, are we making decisions uh, or the ways that we're living, are they helping us to move forward towards the things that we desire the most, or are they, are they moving us away from those things? This is a time of year that we tend to, to feel some inspiration to make some changes in our lives. And here's what I've experienced, at least, maybe you've experienced this as well. Most people are not lacking an inspiration to change. Most of us have inspiration. Most of us know the kinds of things we want to change in our life, especially this time of year, right? We start making New Year's resolutions. We're inspired. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to start eating this way. I'm going to start doing this kind of exercise. We're all inspired. But as we all know, you know this, I know this, inspiration has a shelf life, doesn't it? Inspiration runs out at some point. Um, actually, during the, during the holidays, it was actually at Thanksgiving, um, we had family, Jenny and I had family come up from down south, and, and so we were, you know, we did our Thanksgiving meal, and we were trying to figure out how are we going to do Thanksgiving, and since my family's from down south, and Jenny's family's from down south, we just, I don't know, we make everything southern, and so the, the way that we did that is we just deep fried a turkey, right? And I know some of you are thinking I'm crazy, but deep fried turkey is the best turkey you will ever have, and so we got the big deep fryer, and we put that thing in the oil, and it was amazing. It's done in like 10 minutes, which is the best thing about it all, and then we're sitting there with this big pot of oil that we need something else to do with, and so it was getting late at night, and we were like, we got to go fry some other stuff, man. Like, we got to, what else can we fry? So we just started throwing everything Deep frying everything. We threw Oreos in there. We deep fried Oreos. We deep fried, um, you know, we deep fried pecan pie. That's, that's how we roll. Don't judge me. I know some of you are judging me right now, but stop. We, we deep fried muffins at one point, right? Like we're deep frying everything, making our own funnel cakes. And then this thought strikes me, right? It's around 11 p.m. at this point. We've been out there hooning and hollering, deep frying stuff, and it's 11 p.m. It's cold. It's dark. And this thought washes over me if I'm, as I'm looking at this. And I go, wait a second. I gotta clean up all this crud. Like, I gotta clean all this up. And all that inspiration and laughter and joy that we had been experiencing, it was gone at that moment. Because now 
I've got to live with the reality of my decision to act on a sudden fit of inspiration. And I sometimes think about change kind of the same way, that we have a moment of inspiration and we make a commitment. We're inspired and we make a commitment, right? We want to see change in our life. It's like we see the party. I'm, I'm going to fry up some Oreos. We're real inspired. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to explore faith. I'm going to start asking my parents how I can help around the house. I'm going to start praying more. I'm going to walk away from that relationship that's toxic. We're inspired. But then the inspiration wears off. And it might be the next day. It might take a week. It might take a month. But at some point, that inspiration wears off. And there you are, drinking again in secret while your family is isolated. And there you are, speaking to the people around you in ways that you know is harsh and demeaning. And there you are, you're waiting until everyone goes to sleep so you can get on your device so you can scroll in secret. There you are, even though you were aspired at one point, there you are again, now you're lying to cover your tracks. And there you are, you're waking up in the same bed as him again or as her again, feeling a bit used again. And guys, listen, I've been there. I understand that. And some of you, you understand what I'm talking about. That is a powerless feeling. It is a powerless feeling when you stare down that wide chasm between your inspiration to change and the seeming inability to do so. And then let's just take it a step further for a moment. Because if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, that means that you have made a decision to trust Jesus with your life to walk with Jesus and to trust him with your eternity, but also to trust that his ways are best today. And where some of us get incredibly discouraged or disgruntled is that we took a step toward Jesus, but then not only did, it, did that initial inspiration wear off, you actually began to experience opposition. You experienced more temptation. You experienced more struggle. Choosing to step toward Jesus, it didn't make things easier for you. In fact, for some of us, life got more challenging. It was almost like all hell began to break loose when you made that decision to step towards Jesus. So today, here's what I want to do, man. I just want to talk about what happens when our inspiration to change wears off and opposition comes our way. And how do we move through it? And to do that, I, I want to look at one section of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to some Christians that were living in the city of Ephesus. And if you have a Bible or your Bible app on your mobile device right now, is, is near you, whatever, just open up um, to Ephesians chapter 6. I'd love for you to see these words. Ephesians chapter 6, it's towards the back of the Bible. It's in the New Testament. If you go to your table of contents, you'll find it easier probably. So Ephesians chapter 6. And as you're kind of scrolling there or turning there, let me just say real quick, the fact that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter is significant. And the reason why is because Paul knew what it was, he, he knew what it meant to rethink his life. Paul had been walking a particular direction in life, and he had everything rearranged by Jesus at one point. In fact, Paul had been so resistant to Jesus that he had beaten, imprisoned, and even he even oversaw the death of some of Jesus' followers. And then Paul became a Jesus follower. It was a complete change of direction. And that change in his life, it shocked everyone around him. People were skeptical of his intentions. People didn't believe him. And I'm sure that some even waited on him to see, you know, when this newfound inspiration was finally going to wear off. And my point is this. My point is that if anyone has some credibility to talk about change and what, it, what we should expect, it's Paul. And Paul doesn't pull any punches in his letter to the Ephesians. And he does not paint a rosy picture about what to expect when you rethink your life and you choose to take steps towards Jesus. Look what, look what Paul says. This is in chapter 6, verse 10. He says this. He says, a final word. Then. He's like, I want you to know this. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but we are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now listen, I don't know how you feel when you read or hear a passage like this, but there's a big part of me that kind of pauses for a second, just like, okay, Paul, that's weird, man. Like, why all the talk about the devil, right, and the forces of darkness and evil? That's kind of weird. 
And yet, I mean, just listen, let's just be honest for a second. We've all had a sense at some point in our lives that there are destructive forces at work in this world. And sometimes, even at very personal levels, we accept this reality. In, in fact, here's what I know about you. Some of you, and some of, like I've done this too, like some of us at some point, we have done things comp- that we completely regretted. And we found ourselves saying things like this, I just wasn't being myself. In other words, no one had to teach you this. There's almost just this intuitive sense that there are things outside of ourselves that weigh on us in destructive ways. And Paul echoes Jesus in this passage, and he just gives voice to that and simply says, yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason you feel that at times is because it's real. You have an enemy, Satan, who is utterly opposed to the work of God in this world and utterly opposed to the work of God in your life. You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that any time you take a step towards Jesus, any time you get serious about allowing God to to work change in your life, expect opposition. Just expect it. Why? Because we have an enemy. And when you decide to follow Jesus, to take a step towards change, You have just stepped into enemy-occupied territory. You are not at home in this world anymore. It's like Paul is saying, yes, there are forces of evil that are at work against you. Yes, there are strategies employed against you to discourage you from pursuing the life that Jesus has invited you into. Remember he said, he said the strategies of the devil, the strategies of the enemy. And let me just, I'll just highlight a few of those strategies. A couple of those strategies that, the in, that our enemy is almost guaranteed to throw your way, to trip you up, to bring discouragement into your life. These are a few of the strategies of the enemy. The first one is just this, unsupportive people. Unsupportive people. I, I know that some of you, you have had family members and friends publicly question you about your faith, doubt you, shame you, and it's discouraging. You've had people close to you say things like, wait, 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 you're not gonna become like one of those weird religious people now, are you? You've had, some of you, you've had family make you feel like you are walking away from the way that you were raised and betraying the family. Some of you, you've had people distance themselves from you because of your decision to take steps towards Jesus. And part of what these first followers of Jesus discovered and part of what Paul is saying here is that that is to be expected. That's a strategy of the enemy to discourage you, and to take the wind out of your sails. But that's not the only strategy of the enemy. There's a second tactic to try to keep you from the change that God wants to do in your life that that our enemy will use, and that's just strong temptations. we use unsupportive people, but also strong temptations. I'm amazed at how often someone, you know, begins to move in the direction of Jesus and how quickly temptations rise up in their lives. And it can be discouraging, You know, we sing, like we just sung a moment ago, we sing about the power of Jesus to break every chain of our past and our shame. We read the New Testament and we we see those very first followers of Jesus tapping into the power of Jesus to step out of sin and into new life. And yet so often in our experience, we just experience, you know, our temptations rage. But but here's what I want you to hear loud and clear. Lean in for a moment because I want you to hear this. Temptation is not a sign that you are far from God. Temptation is a sign, actually, that your heart and your life is very alive to God. I mean, just think about it. I mean, I'll just tell you personally. I mean, before I was interested in following Jesus, I noticed something about my life. Maybe you've experienced this too. I really didn't have any temptations. You know why? Because I had no standard to be tempted away from. In other words, the reason that you now feel temptation raging is because your heart has new desires. You have a new boss, Jesus. And you used to be the boss of your own life, and coming to Jesus means you let him be the boss. When I was my own boss, I was not tempted to lie. I just lied. When I was my own boss, I wasn't tempted to watch porn. I just watched. When I was my own boss, I wasn't tempted to berate someone when I was angry. I just berated them. But then I got a new boss. 
And his way is so much different. It is so much better. And all of a sudden, my heart came alive to the reality that, that I cannot love people while lying to them. And my heart had come alive to the reality that using women as objects is not consistent with love. And my heart came alive to the reality that I cannot love and respect others while allowing my anger to drive my actions. So now those things, they became temptations in my life because my heart has been made, remade. So don't be discouraged by temptation. It means your heart has been changed. It means that you're alive to something new now. And, that, and temptation is not gonna go away. And besides, as Paul said all those years ago, why would you expect things to be different? We're in enemy-occupied territory. And our enemy, he knows that he cannot alter our eternal destiny. And so he will throw everything at us to trip us up into sin that would wreck relationships and hang shame over us, keeping us stalled from experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus offers us now. Now, here, here's what I love about Paul's words to the Ephesians. See, he doesn't, just, he doesn't just leave it here. He doesn't just say, you have an enemy. He's working and strategizing against you. He's trying to trip you up. He's got strategies against you, uh, you know, against you and God's purpose of this world. Good luck. Hope you make it. That's not what Paul says because that's not what they experienced. Embedded in the words to these, you know, his words to these first followers of Jesus, he actually gives us language that is so helpful in moving forward. And in particular, there are, there are three phrases that I just want to point out that have huge significance for, significance for us. Remember the very first verse we read? It said this. I'll just read it again. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Stand firm. Put on God's armor. Be strong. Three incredibly powerful statements. Stand firm. Put on God's armor. Be strong. So I just want to unpack those three statements real quick. Let's just talk about the first one real quick. Stand firm. And I love that idea. I like this idea that Paul gets out of standing. It's almost like feet are planted. I'm standing right here, determined not to move. No matter what temptations come my way, no matter what struggles come my way, no matter what opposition comes my way, my feet are planted. I will stand firm. That's the idea. One of our, uh, Jenny and I's, our, our previous homes years ago, we had cedar trees all over the place, all over the property. And I don't know how many, there were probably 25 cedar trees all over the property. And, and we hadn't been there for more than a year before one of those cedar trees that was closest to the road, it actually fell down after a storm. So go out there and, you know, remove the tree and all that. The next year comes, and there was a smaller one that fell in our backyard after a storm. Do the thing, remove the tree. A year later, there was a huge cedar tree that fell and almost crushed our shed in the back. So there's two things Jenny and I learned while we were living in that house. The first one is we decided we would never own another home that had cedar trees anywhere around it. So that's number one. If you got cedar trees on your property, I'm sorry, but that's just what happened for us. The second was this, though. We discovered something as we watched these cedar trees fall one by one. We discovered that, that not all of the cedar trees on our, our property fell when storms hit. There were, in fact, there was this group of cedars that was actually nearest to our home. They weren't moved by the storms. They weren't touched. There was about four or five of them. They were all clustered together. They were right next to each other. And they didn't fall. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. That group of cedars that was all clustered together that never fell, they experienced, those cedar trees experienced the same winds, the same elements, the same storms that those other cedar trees experienced. But there was one fundamental critical difference. Those other cedar trees were isolated. They were on their own. And they fell one by one. But the cedar trees that were clustered together were able to block the wind from the other trees. They were able to hold up the other trees from the outside. Guys, listen, I just want to say this as strongly as I can possibly say it. I get to hear a lot of stories from people who ended up making decisions that cost them everything. Decisions they never thought they would make. 
cost them their families, their marriages, their jobs. And one consistent thread that tends to run through almost every single one of those stories is that somewhere along the way, they begin to isolate themselves from others. They begin to distance themselves from others who would encourage them to keep following God. They begin to isolate themselves from from others who would call them out when they weren't being loving. And I'm just telling you, you cannot be isolated for very long before the opposition that comes your way begins to feel too strong to resist. This is the reason that we talk all the time here about groups. And we challenge you to find connection with others here who want to follow Jesus. It isn't because we think you're bored and you need something better to do with your time. That's not why we talk about groups. That's not why we tell you to find a group. We talk about finding a group here because we know that walking with Jesus will bring opposition. Change always does. And we want to be a group of people who stand firm in the face of opposition, in the face of temptation, in the face of struggle, like those cedars that are clustered together. And you cannot overstate the importance of how much easier it is to, 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 to stand firm when you have a tribe around you cheering you on, encouraging you, picking you up when you happen to stumble. And I'm telling you, for some of you, the most important thing that you're going to do over the course of this series is find a group here at LCBC, a group that you can walk with, which will be a starting point for you to be able to stand firm. So Paul says, man, you want to make your way through that opposition Whenever you're trying to pursue change, expect opposition. It's going to come. Expect struggle. Expect temptation. But man, stand firm. Find a tribe of people like those cedars that are clustered together. But not only that, he he didn't just leave it there. He also said to put on God's armor. Stand firm, but also put on God's armor. Now, I don't know how much armor you have laying around your house um, or in your closet. I don't have any in my house because I'm not weird. I don't have that. But maybe this word picture is a little bit hard for us to grasp. You know what I mean? Like we don't have armor around as much today. Um, But Paul was talking to a world that was incredibly familiar with armor. In fact, they would see Roman soldiers wearing their armor walking around the streets daily. And and again, Paul is using, he's, he's using imagery here to make a much deeper point about how we are to face down the opposition that we will all experience when we decide to change and move more towards Jesus. And he goes on to just a few verses later in chapter 6 to describe the kind of armor that he's talking about. When he says, put on God's armor. This is what he says just a few verses later. This is verse 14 if you want to look at it. He says, stand your ground. There's that idea of standing again, right? Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I just want you to think about these words for a moment. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, word of God. And Paul says, put these things on. Put them on. Which is really interesting language to me. Because we all know that our clothes are kind of, you know, they're usually a way of us identifying identifying who we are. It's almost a way, a statement we make about who we are. It's why you try on different outfits before going on a first date. You know that the clothes matter. It's because you try on different outfits before you go for a job interview. It's also why you have made broad, sweeping assumptions about someone simply based on what they were wearing, even though you didn't even know them. Because clothing matters, right? It says something. What we can wear, it can define who we are and reveal who we are to other people. And Paul says, put these on. Truth, let truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God, let it define you. Because you're going to face opposition. But do not forget who you are. And do not forget what God says about you. Let these words define you. And if you need a really simple way to do this, then I would just encourage you to write this statement down on the screen here and pray this each and every day. Just pray this as a prayer. Here it is. Today, God, today my life will be shaped by truth, 
righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. That's what I'm going to define my life with today, God. God, define my life with these words today. This is why thousands of us start each and every day here at our church pointing our thoughts and pointing our heart in a divine direction by finding a chair, setting aside a few minutes, opening up our Bible, and hearing from God. And I can confidently say that thousands of us do that because there are thousands of you who have subscribed to our daily song and a prayer that we send out every single day. And there are thousands of you who have joined in our Bible reading plans on our app. Why do we do that? It's because we expect opposition. And we want to put on the armor of God, allowing our lives to be shaped by truth and righteousness, and peace, and faith, and salvation, and the word of God. So in the face of opposition, we're going to stand firm, we're going to put on God's armor, and we're going to live in the truth of who we are, but Paul mentions one other thing. In fact, it's how he started this whole passage is with these words. Remember what he said? He said, be strong. But he didn't leave it there. He didn't just say be strong. He said, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He didn't say be strong, so pull up your bootstraps and try harder. Be strong in your own strength. He said, be strong in the Lord. Jesus Christ, and in his mighty power. Bottom line is this. The way to fight the enemy is not to focus on the enemy. The way to fight the enemy is to be so immersed and close to Jesus that his power and his strength keep you moving forward despite the opposition that you face. You know, last week, you know, as David started this series, he, he, he used this little two-word phrase to describe this, stay close. Stay close. When I hear these words right here, to, to be strong in the Lord, to stay close, I, I imagine it like we're entering into a battle and I've, we've got a general who, who knows the battlefield, a general who knows how to make it through. Stay close. Like, I don't really want to go into a war, but if I've got a general who knows what he's doing, I'll stay right by him. Guys, Jesus is the only one qualified to lead us into the change that we need most because Jesus is the only one who has defeated all the forces of opposition. I love the way the writer of Hebrews described this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this. It says, this high priest of ours, talking about Jesus, the high priest, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings that we do, and yet he did not sin. Guys, we have a Savior in Jesus who took on the full weight of opposition, who had all the forces of evil and temptation and darkness weighing in on him, and he stood firm and armored himself and was strong on our behalf, which means this. Man, I hope this is encouraging you. It means that when you struggle with opposition, when I struggle with temptation and opposition, when I stumble a little bit, he's not disappointed. He's not frustrated with you. Come on, man, he understands. He understands our weakness because he's faced them himself. He knows what it feels like to have people antagonize him. Family misunderstand him. Friends abandon him. He knows the challenge of resisting temptation. He marched straight into enemy territory and he defeated those forces. And now he simply says to you and me, follow me. Stay close. Be strong. Follow me. Stay close. Which is why I love the very next statement in that Hebrews passage we just read a moment ago. It says, in light of this, in light of what he's done, let us come back boldly to the throne of our gracious God and there we will receive his mercy and he will find and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most guys listen man Jesus he didn't face opposition and temptation and all of the strategies of the enemy so that we wouldn't have to we're going to he faced them and he defeated them so that we could confidently follow him through it. And if you've made a decision 
to take a step toward Jesus and it feels like all hell has broken loose around you. It feels like temptations are stronger than ever before. It feels like people don't understand you and you have felt discouraged, like you can't go on. I just want you to know then you're probably doing it right. So well done. Expect opposition because that might just be the sign that you are making progress. And make no mistake about it. Jesus is with you, faithfully leading you on towards the change that you desire the most. And Jesus will never inspire you toward a change that he wants to do in your life without also, at the exact same time, empowering you to move towards that change. So stand your ground, put on your armor, and be strong.
have a savior who wants to lead you today, lead you towards the kind of change that unlocks a rich life. And if anyone knows the opposition that that may bring, it's Jesus. He invites you to follow him into enemy territory because he's been there. And he can lead us through. And I know that some of you right now, man, you are facing opposition because you've taken steps towards Jesus. You've been struggling a bit, and temptations are strong right now. I just want to tell you, man, that's okay. It's to be expected. You're walking towards life in the midst of enemy territory. But today, I just want you to hear the words of your Savior, who says to us, yes, you have an enemy, but I am greater, and I have already defeated him. So follow me, and I will be faithful to you come hell or high water. So stand firm. Put on your armor. Be strong in my power. Listen, if you'd like to pray with someone today, then just stick around on our chat because we have some hosts that would love and be honored to have the time to pray with you. And, and if you want to keep talking about the content today, in just a moment, there will be a few discussion questions on the screen that you can talk about with your family or friends or, or even your group this week. And, and next week, let me just say, man, what we're going to discover the catalyst for all true change in our lives. And that without this catalyst, I'm not sure change is even possible. You don't want to miss next week. So LCBC, may the Lord bless and protect you. And may the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Thank you so much for being here. See you next week.